Hi everyone, thank you for tuning in and welcome to the tutorial on computer optimization on quantum computers. This tutorial will have three parts. First, I will show you how to take an arbitrary objective function and represent it as a quantum Hamiltonian. Secondly, I will show you how to find the ground state of this Hamiltonian or the highest energy eigenstate if you solve a maximization problem using quantum approximate optimization algorithm. And I will show you some nuts and bolts of QAOA. Finally, in the third part, I will show you how to implement QAOA in Python using Qiskit, and I will guide you through some practical considerations that arise when running QAOA. I hope you enjoy this tutorial. I'm always interested in feedback, especially if you see an error in the slides. Please do not hesitate to reach out. Let me begin by talking about some of the big picture considerations we should have before uh, talking about solving optimization problems on quantum computers. In general, when reasoning about the complexity of solving problems, and this of course includes optimization problems, we're usually interested in how the time or memory requirements grow with problem size. Or in other words, we're interested in asymptotic complexity. Classically, the most kind of famous classes of problems that uh, all of the problems that we want to solve fall into are either P class, solve problems that are solvable in polynomial time, and P, non-deterministic polynomial, polynomial, problems where we can verify the proof of the solution in polynomial time, and P space, solvable in polynomial time, polynomial space, and unlimited time. On the quantum side, the complexity class that we are most interested in is BQP, uh, bounded error quantum polynomial time, which uh, includes problems that are solvable on a quantum computer in polynomial time with an error probability of at most one third for all instances. And it is, for our purposes, roughly the equivalent of classical P class. This is the relationship between these classes. So in the middle, the smallest one, this is P, problems that are solvable in polynomial time. We know it's included both in NP and BQP, and both of them are included in P space. We do not yet quite know whether uh, what is the relationship between BQP and NP. For example, the problem of finding the shortest path between two nodes in a graph is in P. There's a polynomial time algorithm for it. A problem like integer factorization is inside BQP because there exists Shor's algorithm, so there's a polynomial time algorithm quantumly for it, and it is inside NP because we can verify the proof by just multiplying the two factors and checking if it indeed produces the correct integer. So it is an NP. But we do not know whether it, it, is, it belongs to P or not, and we think that probably not. And uh, some problems are NP-complete, that is, as hard as any problem in NP. And this is, for example, this class contains maximum cut problem, which we're going to talk about more today. And it's kind of a paradigmatic problem for quantum optimization, mostly because of its relationship with uh, Ising spin glasses, which are well studied in physics. But it is an NP-complete problem, right? But it's only NP-complete by definition, right? In the worst case, that's what it means to be and be complete. The complexity, asymptotic complexity of a problem defi is defined as worst case asymptotic complexity. However, if you look at a particular instance, for example, maximum cut on a cycle graph, right? This problem is no longer NP complete. It's actually quite easy. Yeah, there's a polynomial algorithm, polynomial time algorithm for it. You just go through the graph and you pick each out every other node. Or if you think of a max cut on a bipartite graph, right? That's it. Once again, that is a trivial problem. And this is kind of an issue because in general, worst case instances, instances that trigger these worst case bounds are difficult to construct. And uh, proving asymptotic performance of algorithms is even more difficult. So often what people resort to is just running the algorithm and looking at the numerics and seeing you know how well it scales but given the difficulty of finding hard instances this should be always taken with a grain of salt and great care really should be applied when talking about 
quantum optimization and its performance. However, you know, all of this is important and difficult, but we are not really going to wa worry about it too much today. We're definitely not going to solve NP complete problems in polynomial time today. And we're not going to be thinking too much about this polynomial hierarchy and where our algorithms fit in it. Instead, we're going to adopt a different perspective. Classically, uh, there are many al algorithms that have proven performance. Like, for example, matrix multiplication, the naive method is always all n cubed and you get the correct answer, or Dijkstra's algorithm for shortest path. And quantumly, there are also algorithms with proven performance, such as Shor's algorithm for integer factoring or Grover's algorithm for unstructured search. Right? And for those, we know exactly where they fall in this uh, kind of complexity uh, Venn diagram. But some of the most powerful classical methods, methods that are at the bleeding edge, are heuristics. For example, gradient descent for non-convex problems, which is how most of machine learning works. Right? It's a heuristic if it's a non-convex problem, or simulate annealing, or a genetic algorithm. And similarly, the algorithm that we're going to talk about today, quantum approximate optimization algorithm, is a heuristic. And many of the most powerful, the state-of-the-art classical algorithms are heuristics, algorithms that are used every day. And we have no reason to think that quantum will be any different. And what makes this very exciting is that the noisy intermediate scale quantum hardware that is becoming available starts to provide this uh, unique opportunity to uh, develop and numerically evaluate quantum heuristic methods and discover perhaps quantum advantage where we cannot rigorously show that the asymptotic scaling is what we want, what we want it to be. Let us now switch gears and talk about mapping computer, computer optimization problems onto quantum computers. And in the third part, we're going to talk about how to solve them. But we first, before solving them, we have to map them. I'm going to start by walking you through maximum cut as a paradigmatic example, and probably the most kind of well-studied problem for quantum optimization. And then from the tools that I've shown you in Maximum Cut and from the understanding that we develop in talking about Maximum Cut, I will show you general rules for constructing Hamiltonians representing Boolean functions. And that will provide you with a more general framework for mapping your particular problem onto quantum computers, the problem that you are interested in. So what is Maximum Cut? The goal of maximum cut is to split the set of vertices V of a graph into two disjoint parts such that the number of edges spanning two parts is maximized. For example, on the right here, if color denotes part, so red nodes are in one part and green nodes are in another, in this graph, four edges are cut. And if we assign each, ver each vertex a binary variable, plus or minus one, a binary spin variable, then it can be formulated as an optimization problem, as shown below. It's easy to see that this is a correct formulation. Just look at this term and see that if the two variables are in the same part, which means they have the same sign, then this term has no contribution to the objective. Contribution to the objective is zero from this edge. Whereas if they have different signs, then it is one minus uh, minus one, so the contribution of the objective is one, so an edge is cut. And then once you sum it over all edges, you get your cut. For example, in this bipartite graph, where we have two nodes in one part and three nodes in the other part, all six edges are cut. So how do we take this classical problem and map it onto a quantum computer? And in order to solve an optimization problem on a quantum computer, what we have to do is we have to take this classical optimization problem and convert it into a problem of characterizing a quantum Hamiltonian, or in the language of mathematics, a Hermitian operator. And so then our solution classically, which is a binary string, which is the solution to our classical optimization problem, now becomes the 
highest energy eigenstate or in a less physics-y terms, largest eigenvalue eigenvector of this Hermitian operator or of this Hamiltonian. And as a side note, since the Hamiltonian is classical, we know that this eigenstate is a computational basis state or uh, the largest eigenvalue is achieved with a computational basis state. For example, if our eigenstate is actually a, a linear position of, our, of computational basis state. But uh, the point is, we can get this eigenvalue with we can get the solution with certainty because if we can prepare this eigenstate, then we're just going to sample the computational basis states that correspond to the solution. Now. What does this Hamiltonian look like? Uh, this Hamiltonian is diagonal, and the values on the diagonal correspond to the values of the objective function. So if we have a problem, say, maximize f of x, and the x takes all the values on the Boolean cube and dimensional Boolean cube, then our Hamiltonian has on its diagonal value of function f on 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, etc., until f, value of f on the binary string 1, 1, 1, 1, 1. And note that it's a 2 to the power of n by 2 to the power of n operator. And if you kind of squint at it and think about what it does, if we apply it, for example, onto the vacuum state, on the computational basis state with all zeros, then this computational basis state has exactly one non-zero amplitude, and it's the first element of the vector. So if you multiply the two matrices, you'll see that it uh, adds a factor of that is equal to the value of function on this binary string. And this, in general, is what we're looking for. This is what it means for the Hamiltonian to realize a classical function. So we want it to act on any computational basis state as the value of a function. So C applied to ket x should be equal to f of x ket x. And this is now our Hamiltonian. Right. Note that this Hamiltonian is too large to construct explicitly. First, it's to the power of n by 2 to the power of n, so it's exponential in size. And second, if we were to construct it explicitly, it's kind of a silly way of solving the problem, right? Because now what you really have to do is you have to go to the diagonal and pick the largest element and then that would be your solution in the row in which the largest element sits will encode the solution to the problem which of course you don't need a quantum computer for but what we're gonna do is we're gonna we're never gonna construct it this Hamilton explicitly instead we're gonna develop compact formulations and we're gonna construct this operator from basic building blocks which are going to be Pauli Z operators for us, and we're going to build compact polynomial time, polynomial size representation for this operator. And then this would let us uh, solve it on a quantum computer without having to construct it explicitly and have to deal with this exponentially sized operator classically. So now the question is, how do we construct it? And as I said earlier, first I'm going to show you how to construct it for a for a max cut problem, and it's just a simple example, and we can walk, walk through it. And then I'm going to give you general rules that rely on Fourier analysis of Boolean function, functions. As a notation reminder, uh, cat x is simply a column vector. Uh, bra y is a conjugate transpose of it, and bra is a, uh, arrow points in the other way. Note that both uh, brackets, both cat and bra, are simply notation for vectors. It's no different than putting an error over the label for the vector. Then uh, bra y cat x denotes the inner product between y and x. And if the errors are pointing toward each other, that denotes outer product. Or if, it's, if x is equals to y, then it's easy to see that this is a, exactly a projection operator that projects onto x. Okay, with this, we are ready to construct the Hamiltonian. Recall that this is our objective. 
So we want to construct a Hamiltonian that represents, that faithfully represents this objective. And as you remember, what it means to faithfully represent the objective is this. We want the action of the Hamiltonian on a computational basis state x to be c of x, x. And what I'm claiming is that this Hamiltonian that I've written out above is the correct Hamiltonian. Namely, that all we need to do is we need to take our binary variables si in minus 1 and plus 1 and replace them with the Pauli z operator. And over the next couple of slides, I'm going to show you that this is in, indeed the correct way of doing it. So this is our main building block, Pauli z operator. <clears throat> Just by looking at it, uh, you can quickly note that it has eigenvalues minus 1 and plus 1 with eigenvectors being computational basis state. So just taking z and applying it to computational basis state 0, which is a vector, column vector 1, 0, it gives you z 0, uh, gives you the vector 1, one 0 back out. And similarly, applying it to 1 gives you minus 1 uh, factor in front of 1. <coughs> More concisely, we can write it out in this way. So action of z on x is minus 1 to the power of x, cat x, for x and 0 and 1. Now, if it's acting on ith qubit, what it means is, what, what zi means, and this will we will use this notation going forward, is it's z on ith qubit and its tensor product with identity on all other qubits. And what this does, so identity goes through and does nothing, where zi adds a factor of minus 1 to the power of xi. Now if we have two of those, we have zi, zj. This is similarly means that every, everywhere else we have identity, so we tensor product it with identity. And identities go through, but each of the z's adds minus 1 to the power of xi or minus 1 to the power of xj factor in front. And note here that we reorder the qubits so the i's and j are adjacent. So recall that this is our objective. And I hope you see where I'm going with this now. But all we have to do is to replace, do this variable change where we go from si in minus 1 and plus 1 to xi in 0 and 1, and the change is minus 1 to the power of xi is equal to si. And it's easy to show that it is indeed correct change. And keep in mind this change, we're going to do it later, and kind of this change is what enables us to go, this change of variables what enables us to go between binary variables 0 and 1 and spin variables minus 1 and plus 1. And we kind of go between them willy-nilly but this is the change that the variable change that lets us do that. And so with this variable change, this is our new objective. We're maximizing over x, one half sum over edges, one minus minus one to the power of xi, minus one to the power of xj. And here I hope you see how the eigenvalues of Pauli z and the action of Pauli z on the computational basis state x matches this exactly. So what we want to show is that the action of this c is equal to on cat x is equal to c of x cat x, and we're going to do just that. So c applies to cat x is equal to one half uh, sum of edges identity minus the j. Now identity does nothing, so we can uh, move x zero uh, x out and leave x minus the i z j x. And then the IDJX, as I've shown you, is equal to minus 1. It adds a factor of minus 1 to the power of xi, minus 1 to the power of xj. And this is exactly the action of the value of function, of our objective function on binary string x. And so they, this concludes the demonstration that this Hamiltonian, one half sum of, over edges identity minus the IDJ, is the correct Hamiltonian to, rep, to faithfully represent our objective function. And note that this technique, just taking the operate the binary variable si that is in minus one and plus one, and replacing it or mapping it onto the eigenvalues of Pauli z, this procedure would work for any unconstrained binary objective. 
So if you have, say, a cubic, fa cubic term there, then you can do the same thing. And let's quickly come back here to the question of the size of this operator. Rem remember that ZIZJ is a means that is a notation, a synthetic sugar, if you will, indicating that it has identities on all of the qubits. So this Hamiltonian is, as I've said before, is a two, par two to the power of n by two to the power of n matrix, if it was written out explicitly. But because we're writing it out in terms of Pauli Z operators, this actually gives us a compact representation of this operator. So it only has uh, E terms, so one term per edge. So it has only a linear number of terms. Uh, linear is a function of number of edges. And I'm going to show you in a bit how to simulate this Hamiltonian efficiently on a quantum computer. So you're never explicitly writing it out. Okay. But this is not... So what is the principle that allows us to do this mapping? So I've given you this trick of make, mapping binary variables uh, SI onto the spectrum of Pauli Z. But what is the general rule of doing it? What is the, in general, if we have some function f of x on Boolean hypercube, how do we construct a Hamiltonian, a diagonal Hamiltonian acting on qubits that faithfully represents this function f of x? What I'm going to show you is a general framework for doing it that relies on the Fourier analysis of Boolean functions. And hopefully this will elucidate a little bit the mechanics of what is going on here. And let's start with an you know, even more trivial example than max cut. Let's start with a max Boolean function that just returns the maximum of two bits. And here we go to spin variables, minus one and plus one, by doing the change of variables. And of course, we can always go back. N know that this maximum function can be expressed in a multilinear polynomial. And multilinear here simply means that in no point in the polynomial any variable is squared or any higher power. It's always uh, power one. But there can be a combination of different variables in each term. And uh, in general, we can do this for any function, right? Any function can be represented as a multilinear polynomial with up to two to the power of n terms, where each term corresponds to the subset, some subset of indices. And the reason we can do it is by noticing that we can represent a Boolean function as sum of its value on some binary string A times the indicator polynomial. And the indicator polynomial is defined as it takes 1 if x is equals to A, and it takes 0 otherwise. <clears throat> and it's trivial to construct. This is the construction of the indicator polynomial. But all it does is it takes 1 if a is equal to x and 0 otherwise. And so sum of f of a times a function that is only that is 1 if x is equal to a and 0 otherwise, this is equal to f of x. And by using this way, this definition, it's easier to recover our multilinear polynomial. which, of course, can be exponentially large. And uh, the notation we're going to use is we're going to represent the monomial corresponding to some subset of indices S as x to the power of S, which is just product of uh, xi. And we're going to do for if S is equal to empty set, we're going to let set it to 1 by convention. And now we are ready to define the Fourier expansion of a Boolean function. So this multilinear polynomial representation is called Fourier expansion of Boolean function f. And the coefficients are called Fourier co coefficients. And so for, for maximum function, right, it's Fourier coefficients are 1 half, 1 half, 1 half, and minus 1 half. Once again, note that this is in general hard to construct. 
However, we do know that every function, every Boolean function can be uniquely expressed as multilinear polynomial, has a unique Fourier expansion, which is what we're going to use later. Now let's go on the quantum side and uh, recall that we want to construct the Hamiltonian that acts on the computational basis x with the function uh, with the value equal to the function value on the corresponding binary string. And from our from our observation that we can rewrite the Boolean function as the function of the Boolean cube as its Fourier expansion, we, we can write this as the action being sum over Fourier coefficient times the parity check on this uh, subset of indices on which the string is non zero. Now, note that the and here I'm kind of taking some liberty of jumping again between zero and one and uh, x being zero and one, x being minus one and plus one. Now note that products of Pauli z operators implement exactly this parity function. That is, uh, product of Pauli z over a subset of indices s implements exactly the uh, monomial xs. Which means that straightforwardly we can write our Hamiltonian as sum over subsets of indices of products of Fourier coefficient and the product of Pauli z's over the corresponding subset of indices. And this gives us a general recipe for constructing these Hamiltonians. So what are we going to We first perform Fourier expansion of the desired function, and then we plug those coefficients into this formula. So we add the, each coefficient is multiplied by the corresponding product of Pauli z's. And this is a general recipe. And this is kind of why this works, why it is always possible to construct this unique n-qubit Hamiltonian. Now, this is not a very practical recipe, perhaps, because for a general Boolean function, it is uh, pound hard to compute the Fourier expansion. However, if we have a Boolean function that is a combination of some of the simpler building blocks, then we can use this basically this table of how to map simple Boolean building blocks, and we, we can combine them using these rules below. And this is perhaps a more practical recipe. So for example, as an exercise, it's you should try to recover the max cut using these the max cut Hamiltonian using these building blocks and confirming that it does indeed work. And with this, uh, you can construct most practical Boolean functions just by using these building blocks and combining them as those rules describe. So I've told you how to construct a Hamiltonian representing your problem. Now what we want to do is we want to solve this Hamiltonian using a quantum computer. We're going to do it using the quantum approximate optimization algorithm. And what it is in a nutshell, and we're going to go into mechanism and the details of it a little bit later, but if you were to take away kind of one thing about QAOA, is it prepares this parameterized trial state where it starts in the vacuum state and applies a layer of Hadamard's and then it applies these pairs of alternating operators, where first operator is our problem Hamiltonian, is exponentiated pro problem Hamiltonian. The second operator is exponentiated sum of Pauli x operators on each qubit, which is the mixer Hamiltonian. So at each step, we prepare this parameterized trial state. And you notice that each of those exponentiated operators has a parameter in it, beta for the mixer, in gamma for the problem Hamiltonian. And then what we do is we use a classical optimizer to find those optimal parameters such that the prepared state is as close as possible to the target eigenstate of our problem Hamiltonian, the highest energy state of this Hamiltonian. And we do this by giving as an input to the optimizer the expected objective value of the measurement outcomes or the QAOA energy. And we either can compute it exactly if we're dealing with a classical simulation or in case of using a quantum computer we can estimate it from samples from measuring the quantum computer repeatedly 
and we will talk more about both of those options later in the tutorial. But first, why is this a good idea? Well, first, and I will show you this later, that the connection to adiabatic quantum evolution. But in a nutshell, with enough steps, there are multiple arguments why QAOA would get to the optimal solution. For one, it can at least exactly approximate adiabatic quantum evolution. But I think there are also other explanations for why, with P approximating infinity, QAOA can get the optimal solution. Now, we do not execute P approximating infinity, infinite number of steps, infinite number of operators on a quantum computer. Right? Are, they're noisy in the NISC era. And we can only execute a few gates. So with shorter P, the picture is mixed. I will show you how to simulate QAOA. Uh, you'll get a sense to, that, for example, evaluating the energy is not hard for small P. But, for, but sampling from QAOA is indeed hard, even for small p. And uh, there was a couple of other results that indicate that there is some potential for quantum advantage using the sunsets, which I want to highlight is quite different from some of the other ansatzes. For example, so-called hard, very efficient ansatzes for optimization. There is really no evidence at this point that there can achieve any amount of a quantum advantage for optimization. But for QAOA, we at least can make some arguments for why it is a good ansatz to use. But the question is then, how do we implement this circuit in gates? Right? What is exponent of minus i gamma c as it implemented in gates? We're going to assume a standard gate set, probably XYZ, Hadamard, and uh, one gate of note is a uh, rotation around z by theta, which is defined as exponent of minus i theta poly z over 2. And just from looking at this gate, you might see that it is a, a simulation of this simple operator, 1 qubit exponentiated poly z, time evolution with poly z. In the circuit implementing this simple operator exponent of minus i z t is just r z and the reason it is is just by by definition now for a more complicated operator so now we have a two-body term z z in there uh, we have to know that uh, if that if a has eigenvalue lambda with eigenvector v the exponent of a applied to v equals to exponent lam of lambda applied, applied to v times v. And so from this, we can construct, we can recover the action of this operator on all computational basis states. And what we notice is that it adds a phase factor with the sign dependent on parity. As you remember, product of poly z operators computes a parity function. So we see this here again. And with this, it's easy for us to construct the circuit that does it. It is C0, RZ, C0. So C0 takes A, B into A, parity of A and B, AX or B. Then the RZ adds a phase factor. And then the C0 undoes the change to the second qubit. And so this overall circuit adds a phase based on the parity of qubits. Now, we have more than one ZZ term in there. But since they commute, Pauli Z operators commute, we can just concatenate corresponding circuits. So exponent of minus I A Z I Z J T minus I B Z J Z K T is just equal to the product of exponent of minus i a z i z j t, exponent of minus i b z i z j z k t. And because they commute, we can just concatenate the corresponding circuits. So we can simulate them independently and combine the circuits. And with this, we now know how to simulate the operator corresponding to the problem Hamiltonian, the phase separation operator, which is exponent of minus i gamma c. 
And this is half of our QAOA circuit. Now the only thing we need to simulate is to is the mixer operator, the exponent of minus i beta b, which is sum of Pauli axis on all qubits. And what the way we do it is basically taking our is basically taking this operator and diagonalizing it. And the way we diagonalize it is by sandwiching between two Hadamards. And this is kind of a universal technique for simulating things. So you want to diagonalize it and then uh, simulate the diagonal operator using Pauli Z's. And here, the way we diagonalize it, and it's very easy to see by just taking the Taylor series expansion of exponent of minus IZT, can be diagonalized by sandwiching it between Hadamards. And so the circuit is just Hadamard, and then the circuit for exponent of IZT, which is RZ, and then another Hadamard. And with this, we know how to simulate the entire QAOA circuit, right? We can now simulate the, the problem Hamiltonian. We can now simulate the mixer Hamiltonian. And we will see in hands-on session how this can be implemented in code. But from this, it should be fairly clear how this can be done. Now, how does QAOA actually solve the problem, right? So we have this ansatz state, and we start in some with in uniform position. We want to prepare the target state. At each step, we prepare this trial state by applying this circuit. And then what we do is we vary the parameters beta and gamma using a classical optimizer to get our trial state as close as possible to the target state. And crucially, our ability to find good solution depends on our ability to find good parameters. And this will also be highlighted in the hands-on part. Now, what I want to spend some time on is clarifying the connection between QAOA and adiabatic quantum computation for many reasons. One, it frequently comes up, as for example, the explanation for power of QAOA. It also informs some of the techniques for parameter choice, namely using adiabatic-like or annealing-like schedules can potentially reduce the need to optimize the parameters beta and gamma and solve this hard optimization problem. So what is adiabatic quantum computation? The idea is that we want to find the ground or highest energy eigenstate of some problem Hamiltonian by performing adiabatic evolution from some simple, from an eigenstate of some simple Hamiltonian that we know how to prepare. And what it leverages is, is the adiabatic approximation theorem, which states roughly that a system prepared in an eigenstate of some time-dependent Hamiltonian will remain in this corresponding eigenstate, provided that we perform the change, quote-unquote, slowly enough. And so what we're going to do is we're going to use this time-dependent Hamiltonian here, where we start with some simple Hamiltonian, HD, and then we smoothly change our Hamiltonian into the problem Hamiltonian HP. Now the trick, the tricky bit here is that the slowness of it is uh, quadratic, uh, is one over delta squared, where the delta is the eigengap, the minimum instantaneous eigengap between the ground and the first excited state of this Hamiltonian. So. And this gap can be exponentially small. So in general, this might take exponentially long time. So how do, how do we apply it for max cut? Our problem Hamiltonian is uh, I minus, is the Hamiltonian we've already seen, I minus the IZJ. And our simple Hamiltonian, our initial Hamiltonian, is going to be transverse field, which is Pauli X on each operator, which is the same as our mixer Hamiltonian in QAOA. So how do we simulate this time-dependent Hamiltonian on a quantum computer? And to answer that, let's go back to the very basics, to Schrodinger equation. So consider a general quantum evolution described by a Schrodinger equation and say a system is evolving with some Hamiltonian H. 
the solution to this equation is that the evolution is described by this unitary, and the unitary is given by exponent of minus i integral from 0 to t, h of t dt. So how can we uh, approximate it? Well, we can break it up, uh, break up the unitary as product of unitaries over small periods delta t, and we can choose this time step delta t to be small enough so that the, our Hamiltonian describing the system is approximately constant over this interval. And then uh, in our exponent, instead of having the integral, we just have exponent of minus i h of j delta t delta t. And this comes from this assumption that the delta t is small enough to take the Hamiltonian to be constant. Therefore, our solution to Schrodinger equation now becomes this product of of time evolutions under some constant Hamiltonian. There's exponent minus i h j delta t delta t. Now our j is sum of two non-commuting terms, right? It's a like sum of the cost and mixer Hamiltonian. So we still cannot implement it directly, but we can apply the lead schroeder suzuki decomposition, which approximates the exponent of sum of two non-commuting Hamiltonians as the product of their respective exponents, assuming that the t is small which is the assumption that holds here. And by applying this decomposition, we get something that should be very familiar to you. Namely, we get back our QAOA ansatz. So if you look at this decomposition side by side with QAOA, I've rewritten QAOA to match the form, you see that, so on the left we have QAOA, on the right we have adiabatic, discretized adiabatic computation. And you see that they're equivalent if you set p to be large and if you set gamma and beta to be these uh, small small steps. And this is the connection between QAOA and discretized or simulated adiabatic quantum computation. Now, don't this connection don't let this connection fool you because in small p regime, the mechanism of QAOA is actually quite different. And even in large p regime, it is quite different. And I want to, as one example of a paper that highlights this difference, is this paper that shows how to recover Grover's quadratic speed up using QAOA circuits. This alternates an operator circuit, but using a mechanism that is different from the mechanism that adiabatic quantum computation uses. The last thing I want to discuss today is the possibility of training QAOA purely classically in shallow depth and under certain conditions of the problem. So recall that typically to train QAOA, that is to solve problems, to find optimal parameters for QAOA and therefore to solve problems with it. We typically use a classical optimizer to vary the parameters and we use the QAOA energy, which is this uh, cat uh, psi of beta and gamma c bra psi of beta and gamma as the input to the classical optimizer. Now, if we could evaluate this value, this energy efficiently classically, then we could train QAOA, we could find optimal QAOA parameters without access to a quantum computer, which can potentially speed up our computation significantly since quantum computers typically have much lower clock rates than classical ones. Know that we do still need a quantum computer to sample the optimal solution. But in that case, we would only have to execute the QAOA circuit once with optimal parameters. Now, how can we do that? Well, first recall that our Hamiltonian can be written as a sum over, as a sum of products of Pauli z's times the corresponding coefficient. Therefore, from linearity, the energy the value that's going to be the input to our classical optimizer can be represented as a sum over contributions of these products of Pauli z's. And so what we want to do now is we want to see how expensive it is, how hard it is classically to evaluate this one contribution. Now consider one term in this sum. Now we can look at only and we can look at it from like from inside out. So first 
In the middle, we have this product of Pauli z's over the, our subset of indices. And the first thing is around it, it's surrounded by the, the action of the mixer Hamiltonian. In this, it's uh, UB dagger, U, uh, product of Pauli z's UB of beta. And we can look at just this middle bit first. And what we note is that terms acting on qubits not in the subset of indices on which Pauli z's, on which Pauli z's act, these terms will commute through. So the only thing that will be left in O of S will be the terms corresponding to qubits on which the product of Pauli z acts. Now, similarly, when we looked at the, the next thing, so we take another step outside from this product of Pauli z's, we, because it's also a product of uh, exponent of minus i gamma f of s product of Pauli z's over s, those terms that do not touch s, those terms that do not have in them exponents of Pauli z's corresponding to the subset of qubits, at least one, then those will commute through. And so after one step of QAOA, the set of qubits on which QAOA, on which this operator has support, this energy operator has support, only depends on the, on what qubits are connected by product of Pauli z's to, the, to this particular term. And this thing does not grow with the overall system size. It only grows, of course, with the density. And so what you can do this iteratively, you can keep un unfolding it. And after p steps, the support of this operator corresponds to the reverse causal cone of product of Pauli z. Now, if your problem is quadratic, for example, like max cat is, then this reverse causal cone can be quite small. So for example, for p equals one, and you have three regular graph, this reverse causal cone can have no more than six qubits. What this means is that for p equals one, you can evaluate the QA energy on instances that are uh, like millions of qubits. And as you grow P, of course, the size of reverse causal con grows. And at some point you hit the, the hard limit of no longer being able to simulate them. However, these methods have been shown to be applicable to regular graphs with up to P equals at least 11. This concludes the first part of the tutorial. To summarize what we've learned today, first, QAOA will not solve NP-complete problems in polynomial time. That is not the right way of thinking about QAOA. However, QAOA is a promising heuristic for the noisy intermediate scale quantum era, and it has the potential for demonstrating quantum advantage, that is, solving some optimization problem better or faster than state-of-the-art classical algorithms. Second, for any Boolean function or a Boolean objective that we want to optimize, on n bits, we can construct a unique n qubit Hamiltonian representing it. And we can do it by the means of Fourier expansion of the Boolean function. Or more practically, if it's a Boolean function expressed in a polynomial number of local terms, we can construct it using the table that I've shown you earlier. QAOA as an algorithm is deeply connected to a diabetic quantum optimization algorithm. However, its mechanism is not limited to the adiabatic mechanism. In fact, the mechanism is still subject of debate, but it is different. And finally, QAOA energy can be often evaluated purely classically in shallow depth. This allows training of QAOA without access to a quantum computer and only performing the sampling on a quantum computer potentially greatly accelerating the running time of QAOA. The final part of the tutorial today is the hands-on part. So before we can get started, please uh, get the latest version of the notebook from this URL. You can, you can either git clone it, if you're familiar with git, or you can just download it as zip uh, from GitHub. The easiest way to run these notebooks is through IBM Quantum Experience. 
or IBM Quantum Lab, as it's been recently rebranded. And so what you can do is you can simply go to quantum-computing.ibm.com and log in there, and then upload the notebook into the Jupyter Lab. And this way you will have all the dependencies already installed and ready to go. Note that you can also run the notebook locally on your machine, as I will in this tutorial. For that, you will just have to install Qiskit and uh, set up your own environment and handle with that. So if you're proficient in Python and you have prior experience with Jupyter, you can go down that route. So without further ado, let's just jump right in. As I said earlier, you can either run this on IBM Quantum Experience, which doesn't require installing anything, or you can run it on your own machine. And that's what I'm doing now. So if you want to run it on your own machine, you have to make sure that you have Qiskit installed. And for that, you just uncomment this line here and you run it. Or if you have an older version of Qiskit, you, can, you should update it. And the reason you should update it is because this only works on, or it's only tested at any rate, and on this version of Qiskit 0.20.1. And because Qiskit is still not stable, it changes a lot from version to version, and there are a lot of breaking changes from version to version. Okay. Our motivating example, and the thing that we're going to be trying to do throughout this tutorial, is to solve max cut on a simple graph. Recall that this is our max, that the formula on top gives our max, max cut objective. We're maximizing one half sum over edges, one minus size j. First, we're going to drop all the con constants because they do not affect the optimum. And so it just becomes sum over edges sisj. And as we remember, we can construct a Hamiltonian for it just by mapping the eigenvalue, the binary variables si onto the eigenvalues of z. So our Hamiltonian is sum over edges zizj. So to solve this Hamiltonian using QAOA, we need to implement the following circuit. And the rightmost part is easy. So initial state zero given, layer of Hadamard's easy. Now what we need to do is we need to implement those alternating operators, the cost of phase separation operator and mixer operator. So let's begin by importing all the things we're going to need. And let's consider this bipartite graph. Now note that this graph is, of course, trivial to solve. Because it's bipartite, the solution of max cut on it is just take all the vertices in one part and put them in one part. So for example, three vertices on the left become part one, and three vertices on the right, two vertices on the right become part minus one. But everything we do on this trivial circuit and all the techniques we're going to use on this trivial, excuse me, graph, they all apply even for harder problems. So let's start by building the circuit for the cost operator. Our cost operator is exponent of minus i gamma c, where c is the host cost Hamiltonian, which is the sum over edges z i z j. And the, we can do it in by just applying gates. So what we're gonna, what we're doing here, is we're going through the edges. So we create the circuit. We're going through the edges, and uh, for each edge, we append the i z j term because, as you remember, we they commute, so we just concatenate them. And the way we append them, append them is we apply c naught, r z, and c naught. And this gives us our cost operator circuit. And this is straightforwardly enough. Oop. And we can run it, plug, plug some angles and see what comes out. And we see that it's correct circuit. It's kind of hard to see here because the Qiskit, the drawer, the circuit drawer pushes gates as far to the left as it can. So you get these terms. So this, for example, is term corresponding to the edge zero three 
in the graph, then this corresponds to the 0, 4, that this corresponds to uh, 1, 3, and so on. The second thing we need to build is the circuit for the mixer operator, which similarly for each node we apply, which is the mixer operator is exponent of minus i beta b, where b is the sum over all nodes, Pauli axis, what this is, because they all commute, it's just a product of corresponding exponents, which are simply a rotation around x applied on each node. So the circuit is we go through the nodes, and for each node we append this Rx term, right, which is just uh, our Rx gate, just one gate. And we can draw it, looks exactly like we want. And this really gives us the entire QAOA circuit. There's not much more left. So basically the way we get the full circuit is we start by applying a layer of Hadamards and then apply this P alternating operators by just appending the circuit to our appending corresponding circuits, alternating operator circuits to our circuit. Here at the end, I'm gonna add the measurement. And this is something that we need to do if we wanna take use a shot-based simulator or sample-based simulator. If we wanna use a state vector simulator, we don't need to measure, but we will get to it in a moment. And we can draw the entire circuit. We see exactly that we have a layer of Hadamards and we have these terms, each one corresponding to an edge. And then at the end, we see a layer of these uh, rotations, Rx, that correspond to our mixer. And this is for P equals one. And after all of this, at the very end, we measure. Okay, now we can run this circuit, this QAOA circuit. Note that here we're going to be running them in simulator. And let me go straight. Yeah. And to run them on IBM, on real IBM quantum computers, all you need to do is to change the back end. I'm going to show you how. However, keep in mind that these circuits get pretty deep. That is, they start to have a lot of gates pretty quickly. So with noise, you start having issues fairly quickly with real hardware noise, that is. Another thing to note here is that Qiskit uses an ordering where the zeroth qubit is the rightmost or the least significant bit in the bit string. And the, you know, your last qubit is the most significant bit in the bit string. So we need to invert all samples we get from Qiskit. And I added this little helper function for you to use. And so we're gonna do just that. So we're gonna take a backend. In this case, it's a chasm simulator. Chasm simulator is a shot-based simulator or sample-based simulator. And then we execute our job and we get the results. And then finally, for the results we get, we have to invert all binary strings because they are in opposite order of what we expect. And we get just a bunch of binary strings out. By default, I think it's a thousand binary strings that you get. Now, how good are those results, right? Because at the end of the day, we want to sample binary strings that are solutions to our optimization problem. To answer that question, we need to compute the value of the what I call QAOA energy or the expectation of the objective on these binary strings. And because our Hamilton is a classical Hamiltonian, we don't need to do any of the techniques that people use in uh, VQE. We can just uh, measure it directly from samples fully classically. And the way we do this is we just go to the binary string and for each edge, we look at the corresponding bits are equal or not. And if they're not, the edge is cut. So for example, this binary string gives the optimal solution to our problem. Remember, it's a bipartite graph. So we put the three first three nodes, three nodes on the left in one part, in one partition, and the two nodes on the right in the other partition. And that gives us our maximum cut, which is six. So keep this number in mind for later. Now we can compute the energy that we got from the sample. 
And the way we do this is we go through our uh, count with, through the samples that we got. And for each sample, we compute the value and we multiply it by how many samples like this we've got. So if we have, you know, uh, three strings, zero, 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 one, 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 it's minus six times three, and that corresponds adds to our energy. And then we just compute the expectation by dividing it by total number of counts. And so this can give us the energy that we got from running our circuit. And note again that we have to invert the counts because they're in opposite order of how the nodes are indexed in our graph or how they, we index the bits in the binary string. With these built-in blocks, we can finally run fully run QAOA. Remember that the way we view QAOA and the way we're going to run it here is we run as a variational <clears throat> as a variational algorithm. So we need a classical optimizer to find the optimal parameters beta and gamma. Here we're going to use constraint optimization by linear approximation or Kabila from SciPy Optimize. But we really can use any optimizer that we like. So all we need to do to do this is we need to wrap our circuit into a black box objective function that Kabbalah can optimize. And note once again that by con the convention, all optimizers perform minimization, and this is why we put our a minus in front of our objective earlier. Uh, so this is our objective. So with the way we get it is we, we get the backend, we build the circuit, we get the counts, and we compute the energy. Not here, note that here I see that because simulator is classical simulator. So inside, inside of it, the way it gets the samples is it has a, a random, a pseudo, a pseudo random number generator inside of it. So here, for pedagogical reasons, I fixed the seed to show you an effect that I'm going to talk about later. But this is going to also be good for reproducibility. If you run some experiments, you know, in your paper or in your presentation, you can fix the seed for the simulator and you'll get the same samples every time. OK, now let's finally solve the optimization problem. So we're setting here p equals 5. So we have pi, five alternation operators. And once again, and we start from initial point that I chose for a reason that's going to become apparent soon. And we will limit our number of iterations to 2,500 here. But note that we terminate only after 134 iterations. So we didn't exhaust the budget. And we get a pretty good solution, right? Our energy in the end is 5.3. To get the actual solutions, we need to run the circuit again with optimal parameters. So we grab the optimal parameters, we plug them into our circuit, and then we execute it in the simulator. We get the samples, and then we invert them to get the correct order of bits. And this is our full sample. And we see here that the most frequent strings are the ones that correspond to the correct solution, to the true optimal solution, where first three nodes are in one part and the second two nodes are in the other part. And some of the another frequent string is the same thing, but up to bit flip symmetry. So how we can plot how good the results are. And we see the same thing indeed, that you no know, more than 70% of our results are, correspond to the true optimal solution, which has energy minus six or cut of six. So this is, this is pretty good. And we can even visualize the results. So we take our binary string and we color the nodes of the graph using the bits from this binary string. And indeed, lo and behold, this is our correct solution. Now, what if you want to get to run this simulation using the full QAOA state? You want to get the full QAOA state out. So you want to get all amplitudes. And Qiskit provides a state vector simulator backend for this. A state vector is simply a vector of amplitudes. So for example, this bell state, which is one square root of two, zero, zero plus one, one, corresponds to the state vector of one square root of two, one, zero, zero, one square root of two. 
and this is exactly that. If we try running it, so we build a circuit, Hadamard on first qubit C naught, and we execute it, and we use state vector simulator backend when we get as our backend. And then another thing we have to do is we have to do get state vector instead of get counts. And that gives us a NumPy array with all the amplitudes. Now, unfortunately, the qubit ordering issues are still there. And I added this, these uh, tools here for you to use. I took them from this GitHub issue. And what they basically do is they invert the state vector. So if you have a state, you can get a state with the opposite ordering of bits, which is very convenient for us because this is how we're gonna get our energy correctly. But we can run QAA using state vector simulator basically the same way as we did it with sample-based shot-based simulator, chasm simulator earlier. First difference is we do not measure. So when we get the circuit for state vector, we do not add measurements in the end. It's just the gates. Because if we get them, if you do the measurements, then the result will collapse and instead of full vector of amplitudes, we'll just get one non-zero amplitude, which is not what we want. And second thing we need to do is we need to know which amplitudes correspond to which computational basis states. And this is a little helper function that basically takes our state vector, which is a numpy vector of amplitudes, and converts it into a list, into a dictionary, excuse me, that maps binary string to amplitude, similarly to our, cow, our counts work. So first thing, how, we, how can we check that this is correct? We can just take the optimal parameters to be found with a shot-based simulator and plug them into our state vector simulator. So this is where we do it. We get the circuit, we plug the optimal theta here, and then we execute it on state vector backend. We get state vector and we get adjusted state. So we flip the order. And this is our amplitudes. And we drop uh, another thing we do here is we drop ones that are too small, that are under the epsilon, some epsilon value. Though in this example, there are none. All of them are non-trivial. And so the ones, the states that have the largest amplitudes, as you can see here, this is the first one that has, nope, my apologies. This is the one, yeah, Point, point 0.6. And the other one is, this one with large amplitude, same amplitude. No, there is, they, they're going to have all the same amplitude because QAUA state preserves the Z2 symmetry. And we can compute the energy and we get out the same number, which at least tells us that we implemented the simulator correctly. And this com computes the end, this function, little function computes the energy for a state vector result for a full full state. And now by just con converting to a black box objective, same as before, we can run this the full optimization loop with the state vector simulator. And this is going to take a little while. And the reason it's going to take a little while is you'll see in a moment we're going to saturate uh, this limit. We're going to get to this. We're going to hit the maximum number of iterations, which is two and a half thousand. And note here that I'm starting from the same initial point as the shot-based or chasm simulator. So they are comparable directly. You would expect the two simulators to get to the same point, right? Because we're using the same simulator, which is Kabila, and we're starting them, which is Kabila, it's, it's a deterministic simulator. There is no randomness there. And then we're starting them from the same initial point. With the magic of editing, we can cut straight to where it finished. And what we note is that we get a much better function value. We get minus 5.946, which is almost almost six, very close to six. And actually you can try this at home, but we can get, in fact, if we run this long enough, we can we get a solution that's arbitrarily close to the true ground state to the minus six. 
and you can just try try plugging in max or 10,000 here and run it and you'll get 599999. You know, the longer you run it, the closer you'll get. And this is interesting, right? Because we're running the same simulator. We are in the same optimizer, different simulators, but they're simulating the same circuits and they get into different points. Whereas with samples, with shots, we only get to 5.3, whereas with full state, we get to 5.95. So within you know, 0 0.05 of the true optimum. That's a big different difference in optimality gap. And the reason we it happens is because we get stuck within a lower quality point. So if we look at the points where the one optimizer gets stuck, it's pretty far away from the other, the point found by the optimizer that uses a full state to estimate energy. There are two distinctly different points. Now, an important point to make is that this is not a local minimum. So if we just take the same initial point that the chasm simulator, the Kabila with chasm simulator got stuck in, and we plug it into an optimizer that uses full state vector objective, and we run it for just a few steps. And we also make sure that we start, we only work in a small neighborhood of this point. So we set this initial perturbation that Kabbalah uses to be a very small number. And even just in this neighborhood, we already get a better point. We get minus 5.38 roughly. So we get 0.08 improvement in just a couple of steps from this point. And know that it's very close to it. So if you compare this point to the point we, we've seen before, you'll see that they're very close. So in just in the immediate neighborhood of that point, there are better, higher quality points. And the reason for this behavior is that deterministic optimizers like Kabila assume that every function value they get is true. And what this ca it causes them to think that a point that they've sampled is a local minimum, when in fact it is not. So what we have to do is we have to bake this assumption of stochasticity, this understanding we have that the function that we're sampling is not determined is not true always. It's true only up to some epsilon. And without this assumption of stochasticity, we're going to keep having this bad, bad performances. Okay. So that is how we run QA away. And it's been pretty involved. Right, but what we did here is we, for pedagogical reasons, we basically re-implemented the whole stack of tools used in Qiskit. And note that this is not really Qiskit specific outside of the qubit ordering shenanigans. It's fairly generic. You can do the same thing. All you need to do is to implement gates. You can do the same thing in Circ, PyQuil, what have you, Q Sharp. But in practice, you don't have to re-implement QA way every time you want to use it. Instead, you can just use tools that your favorite library, be it Qiskit, be it Circ, be it PyCall provides. So let me walk you through some of the tools that Qiskit provides for you and how they match the, how I'll show you how they match exactly what we've done so far. So remember our pipeline. Right, we start with a problem class and a problem instance, which is a max cut and a graph instance for a max cut. We come up with a general Hamiltonian for this problem class with pencil and paper and using the Feynman method of sitting down and thinking hard. Then we build specific Hamiltonian for this problem instance. And from the Hamiltonian, we can construct the QAA circuit. Then we take the circuit, we wrap it into a black box objective function. We use a classical optimizer to find good beta and gamma parameters. And finally, we get the solution by running QA away with optimal parameters. So first, let me show you how Qiskit can help you with building the Hamiltonian. So these two steps, steps three and four, can be done by Qiskit for us. To construct the Hamiltonian in Qiskit, what we need to do is we need to build uh, an optimization problem in the appropriate format. The nice thing about this is if you already have your problem, for example, in CPLEX format, then you can just load it directly into Qiskit without having to go through any of the, any trouble, the trouble of building the Hamiltonian, and it will do it for you automatically. It's quite nice. 
in our case, I uh, added this little example of how to build the Quadratic program for the max cut. But in general, this is something that this community, of course, is very, very knowledgeable in. So this should be no trouble at all. But once you have this optimization problem in Qiskit's quadratic program format, then what you do is you simply convert it to Ising. And what this returns to you is a Hamiltonian. And now you can just take this Hamiltonian and plug it into and plug it into the circuit. Now here, note that I'm computing, uh, it also returns the offset. And this is simply because that there is a constant term in our Hamiltonian and we don't need to encode it on a quantum computer. So Qiskit will uh, take care of the this offset and you can just add it to your energy in the end to get the correct value. You can generate the Hamiltonian that does look correct. It's a quadratic Hamiltonian with all the right terms. And now we can take this Hamiltonian and we can plug it directly into QAI ansatz, which we imported from Qiskit. And we can draw the circuit and it looks exactly like the circuit that we had ourselves. Know that it here has symbolic parameters. This is because we have not initialized it yet. To initialize it, we can plug parameters by just calling ansatz.bind parameters, and we can put in our angles by putting random angles here. And this way we get the circuit directly from Qiskit. We can compare that the two are correct, the two are the same, though the parameter conventions might be different and are subject to change. This concludes the tutorial. I hope this was helpful for everybody. And uh, please feel free to reach out if you have further questions. Thank you very much.